Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this lecture in the Build Large Language Models from Scratch series. Today we are going to continue with the fine tuning based classification project which we have been working on for the past three lectures. Today we are going to look at calculating the classification loss and the accuracy and we will also implement the training loop today, the testing loop and essentially we will complete will complete the entire fine tuning project. So let's get started with today's lecture. First I want to recap what all we have covered so far in this classification based fine tuning hands on project. Initially we downloaded the data set then we pre processed the data set and created data loaders. To give you a sense of what the data set actually was let me scroll up a bit in the code to show you the data set and how it looked like. So essentially the data set was a spam, no spam email classification. So you can even check this from the UCL machine learning repository. We downloaded the SMS spam collection data set from here, which consists of text messages, which are either spam or not spam. Upon downloading this data set, we saw that it was imbalanced. So there were around 4,800 no spam messages and only 747 spam messages. So then we balanced the data set so that in the no spam category and in the spam category both there were there are 747 messages that is the first data pre-processing step we did after that we implemented data loaders when we implemented data loaders the entire data set was batched into the input and uh, the target so basically imagine the data set that's being split into training testing and validation 70 percent for training 20% for testing and 10% for validation. If you look at the 70% training data right now, due to the data loaders, that data will be split into input and target. So in the input, we have defined batches, each containing eight samples. So there are around 130 such batches of the training data. And the number of columns is equal to 120, which are the number of token IDs corresponding to each text message. To make sure that all the text messages have similar number or exact same token IDs, we have padded the smaller text messages with this token 50256, which is the token ID corresponding to the end of text token. So this is the input tensor and here what I'm showing is the target tensor. This just has zeros and ones. So zero means no spam and one means spam. So when you implement the data loader for the training data, it looks something like this and it has 130 batches. When you implement data loader for the validation and the testing data, the data is batched into uh, similar batches. So we have 130 training batches, 19 validation batches and th 38 test batches. So that's what we implemented uh, in this first three steps, which was downloading the, downloading the data set, pre-processing the data set and creating data loaders. In the next steps, what we did was we took our model architecture and the model architecture looked something like this initially. What we did was we looked at the final output layer and initially that output layer looked like this neural network, which took in the input equal to the size of the embedding dimension that 768 and the output was 50257, which was the vocabulary size. Since we are doing a classification task, what we did is we replaced this neural network with this kind of a classification head as the output where the number of inputs to the neural network is 768 but the number of outputs is equal to 2 spam or no spam. By the end of the last lecture what we saw is that if we pass in any input to this modified architecture so let's say if we pass in an input such as uh, um, let me show you. Let's say we pass in an input such as do you have time and we pass this input to this modified architecture. The output will look something like this. Do you have time and then for each of this token there will be two outputs corresponding to spam or no spam. Then what we saw is that instead of looking at all of these four outputs, we only look at the output corresponding to the last token, which is time in this case, because this last token contains information of all the other tokens through its attention weights. 
um, so we have reached until this stage where we pass in this input and we get an output which is a tensor of 1 by 4 by 2 since this is one batch uh, so batch size so each batch has only one sample so it's 1 4 because there are 4 tokens every do is the first token u is the second token have is the third token time is the fourth token and 2 because every token as i showed you has two outputs corresponding to uh, has two outputs corresponding to spam or no spam then what we saw is that we are going to look at the last output token um, and the last output token will give us two values so this will be value number one and this will be value number two we have reached up till this stage now in today's lecture what we are going to see is that okay once you get the final two outputs from the last token what will you do with these outputs so we will first implement two metrics we'll get the accuracy we'll get the loss function then we will implement a backward pass so that we can train our architecture to minimize the loss function we'll modify all the parameters so that the loss is minimized and then we will do the testing on some new data which the model has not seen awesome so let's get started the first thing which we'll need to do as i've mentioned in the code also is that we need to first discuss how we can convert the model outputs into class label predictions so let's say if you have the input text message as you won the lottery until now we have seen that we can extract the outputs corresponding to the last row right and let's say the output look like this based on this output how can we say that whether it's a spam or not a spam uh, what we can do in practice is that we can apply a softmax function on this so that these two outputs are converted into a set of probabilities. So then the first value will be 0.99, the second will be 0 0.01. Then we look at the index which has the highest probability value. So since 0.99 is the highest, is a higher probability than 0 0.01, which means index number 0 is more likely to be the answer and index number 0 is no spam. That's why this text message will be classified as no spam. Similarly, if you have second text message as do you have time, if the output corresponding to the last row are these two tokens, we'll again apply softmax and then we'll have a tensor of probability 0 0.01 and 0.99. Then index number one is higher and so the output which our model will predict will be one and that will be spam. So these are the steps we will implement. In the code, you will see later that there is actually no need to even implement softmax since we are only seeing the index of the value which is higher. So for example, even if we look at these values, the index, this index is higher. So index 0 is higher. So it will be no spam. If we look at these two, the index 1 will be higher. So it will be spam. So let's go to code right now and discuss how we can convert the model outputs into class label predictions. Okay, so until now we let's say have a last token output which looks something like this minus 3.5983 and 3.9902. As we discussed first we will apply the softmax so that we will convert this into a set of probabilities. So let's say we apply softmax to these outputs and let me actually print let me actually print the softmax values over here. So you will see that when you apply softmax to these two the output tensor has two values 0 0.0005 and 0 0.9995 and since 0 0.9995 is higher what we then do is that we actually look at the argmax which means we look at the index which has a higher value and that will be index number one so our class label prediction will be number one so in this case the code returns one meaning that the model predicts that the input text is spam as I mentioned, using the softmax is optional because the largest outputs directly correspond to the highest probability scores. So we can just take a look at these output and find the argmax. So that's what we are going to do. Let's say we look at the final token and we look at its outputs. We are going to take the argmax, which will give me the index with the higher value and that will be index number one. So my class label will just be that label dot item. And so we'll get it the output as one. Well. So now this is my uh, classification accuracy, which measures the percentage of correct predictions which are seen across a data set. So if let's say the correct answer is class label one, and if I get a class label one, it's awesome. Then my uh, it will be good. So we'll actually compare our model prediction and the correct label prediction, and then that will give me my accuracy. 
So to determine the classification accuracy, we apply the argmax based prediction code to all examples in the data set. And then what we are going to do is that we are going to uh, actually compare it with the actual value in the data set. And then we are going to find the accuracy. So to illustrate this, what we are going to do is that let's say our batch looks something like this, which I told you before. Let me rub this right now. So let's say our batch looks something like this. So what I'm going to do is that let's say if this is my first input, right? I will pass in through my model and I will get those two logits. Then I will apply the argmax function and then predict whether it's spam or no spam. Let's say it's predicted spam. So, the, so similar to this output labels, I'll have another labels which are the predicted labels. So these output labels are also called as the target labels, which are my true values. And here I have my predicted labels. And then I'll just compare these two and that way I'll get the accuracy score. So this is exactly what we are going to do in the code right now. So here you can see, um, we are going to define this calculate accuracy given a loader. So let's say if you are given a training data loader, what we are going to first do is that if number of batches is not specified, we are just going to use the length of the data loader as the number of batches or the batch size. So here you can see, each batch consists of eight training examples. And so the number of batches are equal to 130 like this for the training data sample. So the number of batches will be 130 if we have not specified it. If we have specified the number of batches here, then the number of batches will be minimum of what we have specified here. Let's say that's 50 and 130. So then it will consider the number of batches to be equal to 50 and only compute the accuracy for those many number of batches. So let's say what will happen in this code is that we look at each batch in this data loader. So let's say we are looking at the first batch. Even the first batch you can see has eight samples, right? So when we are looking at each batch, so let's say we are going to look at each batch in the data loader and each batch has uh, eight samples. So I'm going to uh, pass in all the samples of a batch and I'm going to find the logits, which are the two output values the logits of the last output token similar to this. But now imagine that one batch has eight samples. So I'll, I'll have eight such tensors. And then what I'll be doing is that I'll actually be finding the argmax, which are the values for that entire batch. And then what I'll be doing is that I'll compare the predicted labels with the target labels, which is my actual answer. And if it's, uh, if it's a correct prediction, which means if they are equal, I'll update the correct predictions. I'll increase the number of correct predictions by one number. And as I'm going through the examples, I'll also, uh, whenever I make a prediction, I'll increase the number of examples by one. So if I'm going through the first example here, and if I make a prediction, so if I'm going through the first example here, and if I make a prediction here, the number of examples, the number of examples will increase by one. Number of examples increases by one. So when I make the second prediction, it will again increase by one. So I'm just keeping a track of the number of examples and correct predictions. So towards the end to find the accuracy score, I'll just take the correct predictions and divide by the number of examples. So if the number of examples is 1000 and if the correct predictions are 600, my accuracy will be 600 divided by 1000. We are doing a very simple thing here. We are just calculating the prediction from our model and we are comparing it with the actual values and then we are adding up how many predictions we got correct. That's the simplest way to find the accuracy, right? So this is the code calculate, calculate accuracy loader. Now what we are going to do is that we are going to use this function calculate accuracy loader and I'm just going to specify the number of batches equal to 10 for the sake of simplicity. Our training data loader actually has 130 batches, but I'm specifying your number of batches equal to 10 so that you can just see whether we are able to calculate the training, the validation and the testing accuracy on our entire data set. Of course, nothing is optimized here. So our values will not be uh, uh, very good. But I just want to show you that this code indeed runs. So you have this function calculate accuracy loader and first you pass in the training loader. So that will have data such as this from, from the training data set. That's 70% of our data. Then you pass in the validation loader. That's 10% of your data. And then you pass in the test loader. That's 20% of your data. In each case, we specify the number of batches equal to 10, right? Uh, and then we print out the training accuracy, validation accuracy, and test accuracy. The model has not been optimized. We have not yet implemented a back propagation. So these accuracy metrics won't be good. 
but let's just see what they are so when you print out the training accuracy the validation accuracy and the test accuracy you get that the training accuracy is 46% validation accuracy is 45% and test accuracy is 48% it's pretty bad right? it's even worse than a coin toss i could have just done a coin toss and randomly predicted values and i would have been right 50% of the time so to improve the prediction accuracies we need to fine tune the model right so remember what how do we fine tune or how do we optimize the model parameters the way to optimize the model parameters is that we now we can do two things now we can we have the target which is the true values and we have the predicted values right now what we will need to do is that based on the true values and the predicted values we will need to define a loss function and once the loss function is defined then what we'll do is that we'll simply take the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to all my trainable weights we'll calculate the gradient with respect to the trainable weights and then we'll just uh, update so weight new is equal to weight old minus the partial derivative of loss with respect to that weight so we'll use a variation of this simple gradient descent called adam or adam w and so then we'll just continue updating these parameters until the loss function is minimized so currently so let's say the loss function looks like this it of course won't be as simple as this but i'm taking a simplified example initially we start out with this where the loss is not that low and then we move down this loss function and hopefully we'll reach this global minima where the loss is minimized and once loss is minimized then we'll make sure that the accuracy is also higher automatically so then comes the question of how do you define the loss function and what loss function to use if you have studied neural networks and machine learning before we know that if we have uh, if we have targets um, which are pi or let's say if the targets are yi and if my predictions are pi then the loss function which is used in this case is the categorical cross entropy loss and is defined by negative of sigma which is adding over all the class labels and uh, minus yi into log of pi let me illustrate with a simple example here let's say if we have a text data whose true value is that it's not a spam which means that it's one hot encoding is one and zero so let's say this is not a spam but our predicted values uh, our predicted values after our predicted values here are 0.8 and 0.2 then the cross entropy loss is negative of we will need to sum over all the classes yi into log of pi yi is the true value yi is the true value and pi is the predicted value right so let's multiply so we'll multiply 1 which is the true value multiplied by log of 0.8 so 1 will be multiplied by log of 0.8 and 0 will be multiplied by log of 0.2 and we'll take the negative sign of this so 0 multiplied by log 0.2 is 0 and then 1 multiplied by log 0.8 if you take the negative that's 0.2231 why is this a good measure of loss because if our predicted value was 1 and 0 which is exactly equal to true this second will anyway be 0 but the first but the first uh, entry will be 1 into log 1 which will be equal to 0 so if the predicted value equals to the true value then our loss will be 0 which is exactly what we want so this negative of yi log pi is a very good loss function to be to calculate the loss in the case of this categorical predictions in the in classification tasks uh, so to give you just a brief visual flavor negative of log negative of log of x looks something like this so this is x and this is negative of log of x and we want x to be as close to 1 as possible which is this probability of the correct class so eventually we'll start out from some high loss and our goal is to make the loss as close to 0 as possible another advantage of the cross entropy loss is that it's differentiable so it's very useful for us in the case of back propagation right um, okay so let's actually define the cross entropy loss now along with this uh, calculation of accuracy loader what we are also going to do is that we are going to define a loss function which is the cross entropy loss why can't we use just classification accuracy and take the inverse of that accuracy maybe to get the loss it's because classification accuracy is not a differentiable function so we will use the cross entropy loss as a proxy to maximize the accuracy 
this is the same as the cross entropy loss which we used to pre train the large language model so uh, okay so what we are going to do now is that let's say we get an input batch and a target batch always when an input and target batch is given your visual mind should take you to this figure where we have an input batch and we have a target batch so what what has to be done here is that once you get the input batch you pass in through the model and then you only look at the logits of the last output token because that contains the most information and then you find the categorical cross entropy loss between this logits tensor which is the output of the last token and the target batch so the logits tensor output can be something like uh, 0.8 and 0.2 and the target out is 10 so when you calculate the cross entropy loss you will get some value of the loss function so i'll just show you here torch dot nn dot functional cross entropy this is the pytorch functionality which we are using over here to find the cross entropy loss awesome and this is differentiable so it will be very useful for us when we do the back propagation okay so we will use this calculate loss batch function to compute the loss for a single batch and we can also use it to calculate the loss for a multiple set of batches so for, for to calculate the loss for multiple batches we have to use similar code lines as we used over here so if number of batches is not specified then we take the number of batches to be equal to the length of the data loader if number of batches is specified then it's equal to the minimum of the number of batches specified and what is the length of the data loader very similar to the accuracy classification code which we saw then what we are going to do is that we are going to take one input batch one target batch calculate the loss between all the samples of the input batch and the target batch using this calculate loss batch which will implement the categorical cross entropy we are going to add the loss uh, every time we get a loss we are going to add the loss and then that is in the total loss um awesome and then what we are ultimately going to do is that we'll divide the total loss with the number of batches so that will kind of give us an average loss per batch and this is the loss which we will eventually try to minimize using back propagation that is the whole workflow which we are going to follow so now what we can do is that we can implement this loss function on our data set again we have not implemented back propagation so the loss will be very high but i just want to show you the initial values of the training loss the validation loss and the test loss so here again i am setting the number of batches equal to 5 uh, because actually the train data loader has 130 batches i think so that will take a long time to calculate and anyway we have not done the training here so i just want to illustrate that the loss can be found on five batches like this so you you implement the calc loss loader function and you pass in train loader then validation loader and the test loader and then you also pass in the number of batches so then you can print out the training loss you can print out the validation loss and you can print out the test loss and you can see these are the high, these are the values which are pretty high it's again if you in the accuracy we saw that the accuracy was very bad and that is reflected in the loss values as well now we will implement a training function to fine tune the model which means that we will adjust the parameters to minimize the training loss and then you will also print out the validation loss and we'll print out the test loss so let's start looking at that part of the code right now so until now we have finished a number of steps here we have finished uh, let's see we have finished downloading the data set pre processing the data set create data loaders initialize model load pre trained weights modify model for fine tuning implement evaluation utilities which is the loss and the accuracy basically and now we are at this stage where we will actually fine tune the model which means that we will define the training loop and we will implement back propagation so this is the training loop which we are going to define first we will have the epochs which means one epoch is going through the entire data set once right so let's say if you if you are running in one particular epoch the second loop is that we have to go within each batch so each batch has eight samples at least that's how we define the training data loader to be so then we'll look at each particular sample and then we'll calculate the loss on the current batch uh, and uh, we'll implement a backward pass to calculate the loss gradients and then we'll update the model weights using the loss gradient so here what we are doing is that w new is equal to w old minus alpha times the partial derivative this is exactly what we written over we wrote over here also 
uh, and then once the weights are updated we print the training and the validation loss and then we keep on doing the same thing for multiple number of epochs so that the parameters are getting updated so the simplest way to think about this is that the most important step is this backward pass once we do the backward pass we get the loss gradients that's why we needed the loss function to be differentiable once we get the loss gradients with respect to the parameters we can actually update the parameters and once we do this enough number of times the parameters will get updated and hopefully we'll reach a value uh, of the loss where the loss function is minimized this is the exact same training function which we had implemented to pre-train the llm and here's what i'm what i want to show you is that when we fine tune the model on supervised data which means data sets such as the spam no spam label i showed you we need to again train the model so there is training process involved in pre-training and there is training process involved in fine tuning that's why it's called pre-training actually because it's before this second training process which needs to be implemented so let's see how the training process is implemented in code right now so this section i have named as fine tuning the model on supervised data so until now we have actually not trained the model on the data set at all which means that that's why the parameters are not optimized so in this section we'll define and use the training function to fine tune the pre-trained llm and improve its spam classification accuracy uh, a note here is that if you have followed these lectures you will see that the training function is very close to the train model simple function which we used for pre-training earlier the only distinction is that we are tracking the number of examples here the number of text samples instead of tracking the number of tokens which we had calculated earlier so in the code what we are going to do is that there are seven steps the first step is that we have to set the model to training mode uh, so here you see we set the model to training mode that's the first step the second step is reset the loss gradients from previous batch so in, if, when we look at each every batch we have to reset the loss gradients again so let's say we are looking at one batch right now uh, we reset the loss gradients from the previous batch iteration then the third step is calculating the loss gradients and updating model weights these are the most important step so then what you do is you find the loss in that batch and then you calculate the loss gradients through a backward propagation then you do optimizer dot step this is where the optimizer comes into the picture in on the whiteboard i showed you simple vanilla gradient descent over here but in practice we'll use a, a more complicated optimization algorithm which keeps track of the previous gradient which keeps track of the previous gradient square etc so that the optimization is done in a in a better manner and so that the model does not get stuck in local minima then the next step is that we are keeping track of the number of examples so we just keep track of the number of examples which we are seeing so input batch dot shape zero is that let's say if each batch has eight samples when you look at the first shape uh, first value of the batch shape it will give us the number of samples in the batch so for example if the batch has eight uh, eight samples and the number of tokens is 120 so then we'll get eight here input batch dot shape zero which will give us the number of samples over here so then we keep track of the number of examples seen so you can just think of this example seen as when you look at one text message that's one example seen when you look at second text message you increment the number of examples seen by one whenever you go through a full batch you increase the global step by one right awesome now here we have that if global step percentage of evaluation frequency equal to zero so we have to specify an evaluation frequency now if the training batch has 130 if the training uh, data loader has 130 batches in training and if the evaluation frequency is 50 it means that for after 50 batches are processed after 50 batches are processed for each epoch after 50 batch batches are pro processed in each epoch we print and what are we going to print we are going to print the training loss and we are going to print the validation loss so this evaluation frequency just specifies how after how many batches are completed we print the training and the validation loss so here later we are going to set the evaluation frequency to 50 which means that after 50 batches are processed in each epoch we are going to print so in every epoch we are going to print on an average of two times because 130 divided by 50 is around 2.6 
so we are going to print two times in every epoch okay awesome so now to print the training loss and the validation loss we are going to calculate the evaluate model so evaluate model gives you an option to specify the evaluation iteration which means that the number of batches you want to use for evaluation sometimes if you want to show quick evaluation on a sample data set you don't want to use all the batches so here you can just set the number of evaluation iterations to be 5 or 10 since the number of batches is 130 this will really save us time when we print out the train loss and the validation loss so this actually evaluation step is optional but uh, when we do the training you will see that the train loss and validation loss are printed after every 50 batches in, due to this evaluation step then what we are going to do is that after every epoch we are going to calculate the training accuracy and validation accuracy and we are going to print it out so after every epoch what we are going to do is that we are going to print the training and the validation accuracy and after every 50 batches we are going to print the training loss and the validation loss so let's do the training process now for me this training process took uh, around 8.8 .8 minutes and i have a macbook air 2020 um, it does not have very high end configurations but it's a good laptop if you have an i5 or i7 laptop or a macbook this training should take only 7 to 10 minutes for you so here you can see that this is the main code where we write about the training. So we are going to use adamw optimizer. Let me show you a bit about this torus.optim.adamw. It's a modification of the adam optimizer with weight decay. So it's very good to avoid local minima. This algorithm converges in a smooth manner and it also leads to faster convergence. You can try various things here. You can try adam. You can try to change the learning rate weight decay. So this is why this kind of a code opens the door for research. If you just use chat GPT, you will ne never get to change all of these things which are happening under the hood. But once I share this code with you, you can try playing around with various parameters and try seeing their effect on the loss function, on the accuracy, etc. So this is the optimizer which we have defined right now. And then what we are going to do is that we are going to call this train classifier simple. So I'm calling this train classifier simple function and uh, I have to I have to pass the model. So the model which I'm passing in is the GPT model class which we have created with the modified architecture. So the modified architecture is this where uh, the architecture has a classification head on top of it. Well, let me show you. Yeah, this is the modified architecture which has this classification head on top of it. This is the model which we are passing in. And then we pass the train loader, the validation loader, the optimizer, which is the AdamW, uh, number of epochs, evaluation frequency. So this evaluation frequency, as I mentioned here, is after 50 batches, we print the train loss and validation loss. And evaluation iteration is basically when you print this train loss and validation loss, how many batches you want to evaluate. So I'm just doing five batches here so that the calculations would be quick. If you do evaluation iteration equal to 50 batches or 100 batches, it will just take more time to do the evaluation. Of course, this is not the best way to evaluate evaluate because we are only evaluating on five. Later, in I have a code where we actually evaluate on the entire data set. For now, this gives us a good sense at every iteration how the training loss and validation loss is progressing. Awesome. So after I run this code, you can see that I've already run it and it's 8.83 minutes. So if you look at the training loss, the training loss goes down to 0.083 and the validation loss goes down to 0.074. Training accuracy improves to around 100% and validation accuracy is 97.5%. You can even print the uh, training loss and validation loss and along with it, you can also print the example scene. Because then you can see the more examples the model sees, the more text messages, you can see that the training loss goes down as indicated by the blue line and the validation loss also goes down as indicated by the orange line. This is actually perfect training because training loss is very low, validation loss is also very low. That's awesome. That indicates that there is not too much overfitting here. So as we can see, based on the sharp downward slope, the model is learning well from the training data and there is little to no indication of overfitting. That is, there is no noticeable gap between the training and the validation set losses. That is exactly what we wanted. If the validation loss is much higher than training loss, let's say if the validation loss is somewhere here, that is a sign of overfitting. 
Now using the same plot, we can also plot the classification accuracies. So as the loss is decreasing the training and the validation loss, you can also see that the training accuracy as shown by the blue line is increasing and then it reaches one. The validation accuracy also increases and it reaches around 0 0.97 and plateaus. Uh, one thing to note is that it's important to note that we have set evaluation iteration to be equal to five. As I mentioned over here, we have set the evaluation iteration to be equal to five. So that's not so the values which we are seeing here of the accuracy are not representative of the accuracy on the entire data set since we only evaluate on five batches. So this means that our training and validation performance were based on only five batches for efficiency during training. To calculate the performance matrix for the training validation and entire testing set for the full data set, uh, we can also do that. So all we need to do is that then we have to run the calculation accuracy loader. And then we have to pass in the train loader, we have to pass in the model, and we have to pass in the device, uh, either it's a CPU or a GPU. So what this calculation accuracy loader will do, as we have already defined earlier, uh, this calculacy, calculate uh, this calculate accuracy loader will take in our model, and then it will do the prediction, it will compare it with the actual value, then it will print out the accuracy. And it will do this for all the batches in the training set. So it's not only five batches. So this, um, this accuracy measure for the training, testing and validation data set is a much better representative than these plots because these plots are only for evaluation iteration which was set to be equal to 5. So let's print out these train accuracy, validation accuracy and test accuracy on the entire data set. So when you print out these, you will see that the training accuracy is 97%. The validation accuracy is also 97% and the test accuracy is 95%. So the training and the test set performances are almost identical. A slight discrepancy between the training and the test set accuracy. So the test set accuracy is slightly less right compared to the training. It suggests that there is small amount of overfitting. Although there is small only 2% difference is there but it still indicates that slight amount of overfitting is there on the training data. Typically, the validation set accuracy is somewhat higher than the test set accuracy because the model development often involves fine-tuning parameters on the validation set. This situation is common, but the gap could potentially be minimized by adjusting the model settings, such as increasing the dropout rate or the weight decay parameter in the optimizer configuration. As I mentioned before, once I share this notebook with you, you will have a lot of scope to experiment. So you can experiment with dropout rate in the model architecture. You can even experiment with learning rate parameter, weight decay parameter in the optimizer. Uh, you can also experiment with things like unfreezing certain parameters. So if, if you remember from our previous lecture, the only parameters which are being trained here is of course the output classification head. And along with that, we are also training the last transformer block, the 12th transformer block and the final normalization layer. You can do some changes here so you can make sure that the last three transformer blocks are trained etc you can make sure that maybe this is false and that leads to better answers who knows so this kind of experimentation is open and uh, i'll be very happy if you experiment with various options that will even improve your understanding further and try to see if you can increase the test accuracy further to match that of the training accuracy Awesome. So until now, what we have done is that we have, uh, um, let's see what all we have done. We have uh, fine tuned on the supervised data and we have even plotted the training and the validation loss. Now the last step is remaining, which is using model on new data. So whatever is shown in the tick mark here, downloading the data set, pre-processing the data set, creating data loaders, initializing the model, load pre-trained weights, modify model for fine tuning, implement loss and accuracy functions, then actually doing the backward pass and fine tuning the model and training and validating the model. These nine steps we have done. Now what we have to do is that we have to use the model on new data, which the model has not seen before. So that is the real test whether our model, our large language model, how its performance is as a spam classifier. So let's go to the last section of this project right now. And uh, let's see whether our model is actually performing well on data which it has not seen. So after fine tuning and evaluating the model in the previous sections, we are now in the final stage of this chapter where we will use the model to classify spam messages, right? So finally, let's use the fine tuned GPT based spam classification model 
we'll need to define a function first we'll need to define a function called classify review which will take in any text and it will predict whether it's a spam or not and what this function will do is that it will do a number of things first it will uh, and let me actually write this down in description so let's say a text is given such as you let's say a text is given such as you won a lottery right if a text is given the first thing which we will do is that we will convert this text into token ids we will convert this text into token ids actually there is a nice representation of the data pre-processing which we had looked at before i'm just i'll just take you to that part so that you can see how this yeah so if a new text is given we'll first convert the text into token ids something like this and that's the first thing which we have written in the code we'll first use tokenizer.encode so this is the tick token this is the tick token tokenizer which we are going to use it's a byte pair encoder it takes in any sentence and converts it into a bunch of tokens right then we will uh, we'll look at the supported context length and that's equal to uh, 1024 in this case because the uh, so model dot positional embedding weight shape that is a shape of the embedding weight matrix and to give you an idea of what the shape size is it has the number of uh, rows equal to the context length and it has number of columns equal to the embedding dimension so the number of rows will give us the context length and that's why we are using the embedding shape zero to find the context length so the reason we find this context length is that we are going to compare it with the maximum length so what we did here is that we have we have found the maximum token length token id length from the training set which means which is the text message which is the longest and we have got that length let's say that's length is equal to 120 so uh, if that length is equal to if that length is actually higher than the context length then we have to truncate everything down to the context length so sequences which are way higher than the maximum length we have to find the minimum of the maximum length and the supported context length so if the maximum length is actually higher than 1024 then we are going to take the context length and truncate all the sequences to be equal to the context length. In the cases where this does not happen, our maximum length will be used and then all the input text will, will have those many token IDs. So let's say if the uh, maximum length is 120 and you have received a text message such as uh, you have won a lottery. let's say you have received this text message and when you convert it into token ids you you have seen that the length is only 50 so what you will do is that you have to extend this to 120 by adding some end of text tokens so you add 70 end of text tokens here which are this 50256 and you make sure that the length of the uh, text is equal to the maximum length this is very important because when you batch it every sentence needs to have the same number of token ids so you have to pad this, you have to pad every input sequence to match the maximum length. So the maximum length ideally is the length which we have got from a training data set. So what's the maximum email length in the training data set. But if it's higher than the context length, the maximum length will be set equal to the context length. So whenever you give in a new test input, it's first converted into token IDs and then it's padded with this end of text token, which is 50256 so that the length is equal to the uh, length is equal to the maximum length then we convert it into a tensor to add the batch dimension uh, and then we perform the model inference so we first calculate the prediction so we get the logits tensor which is the logits of the last output token and then we apply torch.argmax so we have seen this implementation um, let me recap your understanding we have seen this implementation in this part of the code right where we take the argmax and this gives us the prediction whether it's spam or not a spam and then that is our final answer so this model this model here is our trained model which we are using now for inference for inference on any new text message so the main magic happens in this line where our input tensor is passed through this model and then we predict the label but before that we have to make sure that the token ids are equal to the maximum length now what now let us actually take two sentences and let us pass them through our classify review function and let's see whether our model predicts them as, as spam or no spam. So the first sentence I'm taking is you are a winner. You have been specially selected to receive $1,000 cash or $2,000 reward. Clearly it looks like a spam, right? And this is from a testing set. My model has not seen it in the training data. 
I am going to pass it through the classify review function and let me print out the output and our model is clearly recognizing the output to be that this is a spam. Then let's take a second sentence. Hey, just wanted to check if we are still on for dinner tonight. Let me know. I'll again pass it through the model and I'll check whether it's spam or no spam. This looks like a very legitimate message, right? And it's clearly not a spam and the model makes a correct prediction that it's not a spam. So this seems that our model is doing an amazing job. It's actually recognizing spam as spam and not a spam as not a spam. When I share this code with you, I actually encourage you to play around with several different text messages and check how the large language based model is doing. But this is an awesome example which we have finished. I never thought an LLM could be used for classification task. But this kind of an architecture when I saw attaching a classification head on top of the GPT architecture, it really blew my mind. It's awesome and it really works. We have brought down the loss, we have increased the accuracy and we have tested this model on new text samples and it seems to be performing well. Uh, this is pretty awesome, right? And through this, I hope you also understood the concept of fine tuning. Remember, we have used pre-trained weights from GPT-2, but we needed to do the training procedure once more. So that is one disadvantage you might say of fine tuning that you need to spend more time on doing additional training on specific data set. What is the specific data set which we are using here? It is the spam collection. Uh, but this additional tuning also gives us an advantage that now our model is specifically working very well to this data set and it can act as a spam classifier. We can even go ahead and save the model in case we want to reuse the model later. And please keep this trick in mind because if you do not save the model, you will need to train it again. So just torch.save. It's an awesome functionality implemented by Tor, PyTorch and I'll, I'll share the link to this also. Torch.save allows you to save the model parameters so that you can just use them later. Uh, and then you can load the same model parameters using torch.load and you specify the path where you saved the model parameters. And then you can directly use the loaded parameters to do inference or to do further fine tuning, etc. That will save a lot of time and effort for you. This brings us to the end of this lecture where we have successfully implemented a LLM spam classifier project. And uh, this project showed you how to combine fine tuning with pre-training on a very specific data set. I hope you understood why it is called pre-training and fine tuning and why we need fine tuning. If we did not do fine tuning, our model was having a very bad prediction. So if you see above, we had a special section where we had displayed the model prediction. Yeah. So if we did not fine tune and if you give something in the prompt itself, like is the following text spam answer with a yes or no, the model could not answer correctly. That's why you need to fine tune. You need to change the GPT model architecture so that the model starts answering better and its accuracy is improved. The same thing what you learned right now, the same code can be applied to a wide range of classification tasks with different range of different data sets. And I encourage you to explore with different data sets that will not only improve your understanding, but it will make you much more confident as an LLM engineer. Now I have taught you the nuts and bolts of how to do fine tuning. So you should not be scared of when people say the word fine tuning. It's just changing the model parameters, training it again on specific data so that it performs well on that data set. In the next set of lectures, we are going to look at instruction fine tuning. So until now we have looked at classification fine tuning, right? Which is just one, one category of fine tuning, but another major category is instruction fine tuning. So we'll actually be building our own chatbot, which can answer specific, which can answer or reply to specific instructions. So we'll cover that in the subsequent set of lectures. Thanks everyone. I'm, I hope you are enjoying this whiteboard approach plus this coding approach. As you are following, uh, please keep a track of the notes. Please make your own notes and run your own code. Ask questions, uh, discuss with each other so that your understanding is improved. Maybe change the data set. Instead of spam collection, maybe use a hard disease data set and run the same code. Who knows, you'll develop an awesome model. This opens a lot of research opportunities, not only with respect to LLM architecture, changing and testing various LLM architecture, but also with respect to applying this architecture on various classification projects. Thanks so much everyone. I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.